，大家好。又到咗讀你聽嘅時間啦喎，咁啊，我哋繼續讀呢個 Charles Dickens 嘅 Great Expectations 第幾節咧？五十六，冇錯，第五十六節。咁啊，上回講到最尾咧，就其實唔係最尾嘅，成上成成回都係都係誒誒，稍為個氣氛又緩和翻啲喎。少少小插曲，我就係阿 Wemmick 結婚，咁啊阿 Pip 咧就去觀禮。Okay. 啊，本來係講阿 Prophet 被差佬捉咗噶嘛，係、mm-hmm. 咪？即係就嚟死噶啦嘛，係咪？咁啊財產又充公，即係阿 Pip 應該係好唔開心噶嘛。咁但係竟然有個小插曲喎，就係我話 Wemmick 結婚。咁啊，阿 Pip 啊，冠禮，咁又即系又結交咗個，即系真即系正式説明咗佢真係結交咗個朋友嘅、嗯，除咗 Herbert 之外，嚇、嗯，咁誒，即係一個一個一個喜訊啦，都叫做係咪？咁、嗯、然之後去到即係差唔多尾聲噶啦，嚇、啊，咁最後嗰幾回啦，咁啊睇下阿 Pip。呢、这個係啦 ，Professor 啦，同埋 Stella 啦，同埋你上一次有提到嘅 Misception 啦，同我關心嘅 Jo 啦，佢哋點樣去收場咧？係咪啊？好嘛，咁我哋繼續咯喎，好唔好？要入正題噶啦，唔可以再插曲噶啦。嗯。Chapter fifty six. He lay in prison very ill. 呢個 he 嘅字係邊個啦？啊 ，professor。During the whole interval between his committal for trial and the coming round of his sessions, he had broken two ribs. They had wounded one of his lungs, and he breathed with great pain and difficulty, which increased daily. It was the consequence of his hurt that he spoke so low as to be scarcely audible. Therefore, he spoke very little. But he was ever ready to listen to me, and it became the first duty of my life to say to, say to him and read to him what I knew he ought to hear. Being far too ill to remain in the common prison, he, has, he was removed after the first day or so into the infirmary. This gave me opportunities of being with him that I could not otherwise have had. And but for his illness, he would have been put in irons. For he was regarded as a determined prison breaker, and I know not what else. Although I saw him every day, it was for only a short time. Hence, the regularly recurring spaces of our separation were long enough to record on his face any slight changes that occurred in his physical state. I do not recollect that I once saw any change in it for the better. He wasted and became slowly weaker and worse day by day from the day when the prison door closed upon him. The kind of submission or resignation that he showed was that of a man who was tired out. I sometimes derived an impression from his manner, or from a whispered word or two which escaped him, that he pondered over the question whether he might have been a better man or a better man under better circumstances. But he never justified himself by a hint tending that way, or tried to bend the past out of his eternal shape. It happened on two or three occasions in my presence that his desperate reputation was alluded to by one or other of the people in attendance on him. A smile crossed his face then, and he turned his eyes on me with a trustful look, as if he were confident that I had seen some small redeeming touch in him, even so long ago as when I was a little child. As to all the rest, he was humble and contrite, and I never knew him complain. When the sessions came round, Mr. Jaggers caused an application to be made for the postponement of his trial until the following sessions. It was obviously made with the assurance that he could not live so long, and was refused. The trial came on at once, and when he was put to the bar, he was seated in the chair. No objection was made to my getting close to the dock on the outside of it and holding the hand that he stretched forth to me. The trial was very short and very clear. Such things as could be said for him were said. 
how he had taken to industrious habits and had striven lawfully and reputably, reputably. But nothing could unsay the fact that he had returned and was there in presence of a judge and jury. It was impossible to try him for that and do otherwise than find him guilty. At that time, it was the custom to devote a concluding day to the passing of sentences and to make a finishing effect with the sentence of death. But for the indelible picture that my remembrance now holds before me, I could scarcely believe, even as I write these words, that I saw two and thirty men and women put before the judge to receive that sentence together. Foremost among the two and thirty was he, seated, that he might get brief enough to keep life in him. The whole scene starts out again in the vivid colours of the moment, down to the drops of April rain on the windows of the court, glittering in the rays of April sun, penned in the dock as I again stood outside it at a corner with his hand in mine, were the two and thirty men and women, some defiant, some stricken with terror, some sobbing and weeping, some covering their faces, some staring gloomily about. There had been shrieks from among the women convicts, but they had been stilled, and a hush had succeeded. The sheriffs with their great chains and nosegays, other civic gagoos, gagos, and, mon and monsters, criers, ushers, and a great gallery full of people, a large theatrical audience, looked on as the two and thirty and the judge were solemnly confronted. Then the judge addressed them. Among the wretched creatures before him whom he must single out for single address was one who almost from his infancy had been an offender against the laws, who after repeated imprisonments and punishments had been at length sentenced to exile for a term of years, and who, under circumstances of great violence and daring, had made his escape and been resentenced to exile for life. The miserable man would seem for a time to have become convinced of his errors, when far removed from the scenes of his old offences and to have lived a peace, peaceable and honest life. When in a fatal moment yielding to, the, to those propensities and passions, the, indul the indulgence of which had so long rendered him a scourge to society, he had quitted his haven of rest and repentance and had come back to the country where he was proscribed. Being here presently denounced, he had for a time succeeded in evading the offices of justice, but being at length seized while in the act of flight, he had resisted them and had. He best knew whether by express design or in the blindness of his hardihood, caused the death of his denouncer to whom his whole career was known. The appointed punishment for his return to the land that had cast him out being death, in his case being the aggregated, this aggravated case, he must prepare himself to die. The sun was striking in at the great windows of the court through the glittering drops of rain upon the glass, and it made a broad shaft of light between the, the two and thirty and the judge, linking both together and perhaps reminding some among the audience how both were passing on, with absolute equality to the greater judgment that knoweth all things and cannot err. Rising for a moment, a distinct speck of face in his way of light, the prisoner said, My lord, I have received my sentence of death from the Almighty, but I bow to yours, and sat down again. There was some hushing, and the judge went on with what he had to say to the rest. Then they were all formally doomed, and some of them were supported out, and some of them sauntered out with a haggard look of bravery, and a few nodded to the gallery, and two or three shook hands, and others went out chewing the fragments of herb they had taken from the sweet herbs lying about. He went last of all because of having to be helped from his chair and to go very slowly. And he held my hand while all the others were moved, and while the audience got up and pointed down at this criminal or at that, the most of all at him and me. I earnestly hoped and prayed that he might die before the recorder's report was made, but in the dread of his lingering on, I began the night to write out a petition to the Home Secretary of State, setting forth my knowledge of him and how it was that he had come back for my sake. I wrote it as fervently and pathetically as I could, and when I had finished it and sent it in, 
I wrote out other petitions to such men in authority as I hoped were the most merciful, and drew up one to the crown itself. For several days and nights after he was sentenced, I took no rest except when I fell asleep in my chair, but was wholly absorbed in these appeals. And after I had sent them in, I could not keep away from the places where they were, but felt as if they were more hopeful and less desperate when I was near them. In this unreasonable restlessness and pain of mind, I would roam the streets of an evening, wandering by those offices and houses where I had left the petitions. To the present hour, the weary western streets of London on a cold, dusty spring night, with their ranges of stern, shuttered mansions and their long rows of lamps, and melancholy to me from this association. The daily visits I could make him were shortened now, and he was more strictly kept. Seeing or fancying that I was suspected of an intention of carrying poison to him, I asked to be searched before I sat down at his bedside, and told the officer who was already there that, that I was willing to do anything that would assure him of the singleness of my designs. Nobody was hard with him or with me. There was duty to be done, and it was done, but not harshly. The officer always gave me the assurance that he was worse, and some other sick prisoners in the room, and some other prisoners who attended on them as sick nurses, always joined in the same report. As the days went on, I noticed more and more that he would lie placidly looking at the white ceiling, with an absence of light in his face, until some word of mine brightened it for an instant, and then it would subside again. Sometimes he was almost or quite unable to speak. Then he would answer me with slight pressures on my hand, and I grew to understand his meanings very well. The number of days had risen to ten when I saw a greater change in him than I had seen yet. His eyes were turned towards the door and lighted up as I entered. "Dear boy," he said as I sat down by his bed, "I thought you were late, but I know you couldn't be that. It is just a time," said I. I waited for it at the gate. "You always wait at the gate, don't you, dear boy?" Yes, not to lose a moment of time. Thank you, dear boy. Thank you. God bless you. You've never deserted me, dear boy. I pressed his hand in silence, but I could not forget that I had once meant to desert him. And what's the best of all, he said, you've been more comfortable along with me since I was under a dark cloud than when the sun has shone. That's the best of all. He lay on his back, breathing with great difficulty. Do what he would, and love me though he did. The light left his face. Ever again, and a film came over the placid look at the white sea. Are you in much pain today? I don't complain of none, dear boy. You never do complain. He had spoken his last words. He smiled, and I understood his touch to mean that he, he wished to lift my hand and lay it on his breast. I laid it there, and he smiled again and put both hands upon it. The allotted time ran out while we were thus, but looking round. I found the governor of the prison standing near me, and he whispered, "You needn't go yet." I thanked him gratefully and asked, "When I speak to him, if he can hear me?" The governor stepped aside and beckoned the officer away. The change, though it was made without noise, drew back the film from the placid look at the white ceiling, and he looked most affectionately at me. "Dear Magwitch, I must tell you now, at last. You understand what I say?" A gentle pressure on my hand. "You had a child once." Whom you loved and lost, a stronger pressure on my hand. She lived and found powerful friends. She is living now. She is a lady and very beautiful, and I love her. With a last faint effort, which would have been powerless but for my yielding to it and assisting it, he raised my hand to his lips. Then he gently let it sink upon his breast again, with his own hands lying on it. The placid look at the white ceiling came back and passed away, and his head dropped quietly on his breast. Mindful then of what we had read together, I thought of the two men who went up into the temple to pray, and I knew there were no better words that I could say beside his bed than, "O Lord, be merciful to him, a sinner." 再咁啦，咁啊，似乎佢去咗咯喎，系咪？系咯，安详地去咗。咁成節都係講，即、就、係、是、一個好沉重嘅一個章節啦，就係、是、講佢個，佢、嗯、個 trial 啦，係咪？佢、嗯、法庭上面嘅嘅嘅判嘅裁決啦，咁當然就係死啦，咁、嗯啊、然之後，因為佢有病在身啦，咁啊俾佢
探病啦，將、嗯、佢搬去一個類似醫院咁嘅嘢啦，啊，即係監禁住啦，當然。咁啊，睇佢每日消瘦啦，即係一種慢慢睇住一個人嘅生命流走嘅一個狀態，係好慘嘅，係好淒涼嘅，咁咯。咁啊，我原我原本諗住上一節就係講呢樣嘢，點知佢唔係，佢插咗一節入去先，將氣氛帶起咗，但係又再再插落去咁樣。咁誒。呃我覺得最尾佢話俾佢聽呢個都係點講呢？似乎係帶俾佢阿 Pip 自己個人嘅一種釋懷多於、嗯、多於俾 p r o p e r 因為 p r o p e r 都差唔多死嗰下佢先至講嚇咁，但係佢表現出嚟嘅就係即係佢都臨終聽到呢樣嘢，呢啲咁哇咁緊要嘅消息都～都不好，我想反應，但我反應唔到，我走啦。<笑>有一種咁嘅感覺，講笑啫，即係誒、呃，似乎佢文字表現出嚟就係、是、佢聽到呢個消息係釋懷啊，即係覺得啊， okay. 太好啦，太好啦咁樣。即係我有個女，佢而家係個 lady， 係咪？佢好，佢又受到保護。然之後，我最信任嘅阿 Pip 竟然係中意佢添。呢全部都係好消息嚟嘅，係咪？咁啊，更加可以安心咁去啦。咁阿 Pip 亦都最盡咗佢責任，即係佢真係有講到呢個消息俾佢聽。咁誒，咁呢、呃、個就係 Profits 嘅結局啦。嚇，咁啊，雖然係失去咗自由，但係都起碼帶住佢起信離開啊，都未嘗唔係一件壞事。咁接落嚟要交代嘅角色，咁啊，仲有邊幾個咧？咁啊 ，Savishon 啦 ，Stella 啦。同埋呢兩個一定要交代啦，仲有邊個啊？阿 Jo 啦，仲有 Jo 啦，係嘛 ？Wendy 唔需要講啦，啊 Wendy 已經講咗啦。Jo 啊 ，Biddy 啊，係咯 ，Jo 啊 ，Biddy 啊，咁啦。咁 Mr. Jaggers 可能都會提少少啩，啊咁主要都係呢幾個啫。Her 阿 Herbert 都其實講唔講冇乜所謂啦，因為 Herbert 其實都。都好好噶啦，因為佢佢又有真係有個真係有個生意，人咪又又娶到阿 Clara， 咁都係好都係一個好人有好報啦，屬於啊咁其他其他就真係唔真係唔使講，其他啲都係唔係幾好嘅，即係喺 Dickens 描描寫到佢哋都唔係幾好噶啦。做到係咯，即係做係好人，即係會交代，<笑>即係其他啲全部都係嚇、啊、見見見高拜見低踩嗰啲人就。嗰啲就唔需要講，好嘛？咁啊，睇下下一回啊，交代邊個啦？輪到我，我估係阿 Jo 同 Biddy 咯。我估，我估係阿 Jo 同 Biddy 先，或者或者咪 Sabrina 先咁、嗯，好嘛？好啦，下次再講啊。拜拜。